All right, everybody, it's almost 10 o'clock. Do we have any uh, uh, first time visitors with us today? One, two, three, four. Where are you from, man? Union County. Union County, amen. What city are you from, brother? Anderson, South Carolina. Anderson, South Carolina. All right. Where are you from, brother? Amen. All right. Glad to have you guys. I'm obviously not Brother Tony. He normally leads the Sunday school, but um, it's uh, right at about uh, 10 o'clock. Brother Sean McDaniel, would you open us up in prayer? Ask the Lord to help us. All right, if you got your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter number 20. While you're doing that, I'll kind of give you a little bit of an introduction. Some of y'all probably don't know my name. My name is Sam Green. I've been coming to this church for about a year now, and this church has been a tremendous blessing to me. Pastor Lawson's been a huge blessing to me. Um, all the people that I have met here have been extremely nice and supportive of me, and I appreciate that. You know, it's so rare to be able to find a church like this. I was going to churches um, before I came here, and man, it just, it, it ain't the same. And oftentimes we take that for granted. The pastor that we have, um, and the fact that we read that King James Bible, uh, but uh, yeah, so I'm actually just getting back um, from Jacksonville, Florida, I was down there at the King James Bible Jubilee with Brother Tony, that's where he's at, he stayed an extra day, and uh, when he asked me a couple weeks ago, would you lead Sunday school, I was thinking, Phew, yeah, I'll, I'll do it, man, but uh, you know, uh, not much of a teacher, um, but I'll actually be doing a little bit of preaching today, um, Lord willing, um, God called me to preach about a year ago, and I'll, I'll never forget that. Um, I remember exactly where I was at. I was walking down from my office, and I heard him start to put that burden on my heart, and I said, you got the wrong one. <laughs> I know you ain't talking to me. And, uh, you know, as time progressed, I started to surrender bit by bit to him, but I never fully surrendered. It started with a little bit of street preaching, a little bit of soul winning, this and that. And as you get in that book, it's like Samuel, right? Like when the Lord was calling him, and the voice of the Lord came to Samuel, and he didn't know the voice of the Lord yet. But he kept running back to Eli, and he was saying, Eli, you called for me. He said, no, I didn't go back to sleep, because the Bible says that Samuel knew not the voice of the Lord yet. But as time progressed, God revealed himself by the word of the Lord to Samuel, and that's how Samuel, you know, got into his line of ministry, essentially. So it's kind of the same thing with me. I talked to Brother Tony on Friday night down there at the Jubilee, and I was like, man, I really think the Lord's calling me to preach. And y'all know Tony. He said, lean into that thing, brother, and stop running from it, and get up there and let her rip. I said, praise God. Um, so, uh, yeah, turn with me in your Bibles real quick. Acts chapter number 20. Let me tell you one thing. I don't know if you guys know anything about a, about a, about a jubilee, old-timey preaching. Whew. I thought I was on fire for Jesus Christ before I went down there, and it's like the Lord dipped me in kerosene. So I'm going to try to be on my best behavior. I know it's just Sunday school, praise God, but I'm going to try to try to do what the Lord's laid on my heart. He's put this burden. Amen. He's put this burden on my heart for, for about four weeks. When I was studying my Bible, it ain't nothing I got from another preacher, nothing I got from a commentary. Uh, let's go to Acts 20 and verse number 9. Now I read this thing and I said, shoo, Lord, you, you, you spoke to me here. So we got Acts 20 and verse number 9. And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep. And fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. Now you read that thing and you're like, okay, what, what, what's, what's so significant about that big deal? Well, the Lord showed me four things from that. The first thing I see is, is that Eutychus sat down. And how many times in our Christian life do we sit down? And then the second thing that I see is, is that he's sitting in a window. It says he's in a third story loft. Why are you sitting up in a window that high? Second point is, is he was somewhere he shouldn't be. 
So first he sat down. Secondly, he was somewhere he shouldn't be. And thirdly, it says while Paul was long preaching, he, he fell in a deep sleep. So he sat down, he was somewhere he shouldn't be, and then he fell into a deep sleep. And the, those are the three points that the Lord showed me. But the result of all three of those things in our Christian life is death. I'm not talking about your salvation. I'm talking about spiritual death, lack of fellowship with Jesus Christ. First he sat down, then he sat down somewhere he shouldn't be. Amen. And then it says he fell in a deep sleep. And the result of all that, it says he was taken up dead. He fell down from that third law. And those are the three points I want to teach on today here, preach on. And uh, the first one we've got is, is that he sat down. Amen. How many times have we sat down? If you haven't learned yet that this Christian life is a fight, then you're losing that fight. I can promise you that. Amen. And, uh, you know, Paul likens it to a battle. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Amen. And if you're sitting down, you're not able to fight. Your enemy is going to be easily able to, to dominate you and conquer you. And our enemy is Satan, friends. That's what he wants. He's the one that wants us to sit down. So we can see that he said, and he sat in a window, a certain young man named Eutychus. Amen. And, uh, you know, I'll be honest, friend. Many years of my life, I sat down. I was sitting down. I got saved when I was 10 years old. Amen. And then I went to, to college. I started dating a girl I shouldn't have been dating. And you couldn't even tell that I was a Christian for many years. I sat down. And, uh, but bless God, uh, he got me back on the right track. And that's what, that's what Satan wants us to do. You know, the Bible says that, um, you know, for we are not ignorant of Satan's devices, you know, lest he get an advantage over us. And I always get back to uh, Psalm 40. And that's the one that really speaks to me is that, um, you know, the Lord says that, uh, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me, and he heard my cry. He hath also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, amen, and established my goings. He hath also put a new song in my mouth, amen, even praise unto our God, and many shall see it and fear and turn unto the Lord. Now, that's a beautiful thing right there. You say, he put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God, and many shall see it. Well, if it's a song in your mouth, how can they see it? I thought you were supposed to hear that thing. No, you're supposed to see it in the way that you live for Jesus Christ. So let's get to that first point here. We got a battle on our hands, friend. As Christians, we're told to be soldiers. Paul said, uh, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. So you got to fight, friend. Satan wants us just to drift through life and go through the motions. But before you know it, as that thing progresses, you're going to end up in a spiritual death. I'm speaking from experience. So we got to be on our feet. Turn with me real quick here to Ephesians 6. Amen. Pick it up in uh, 11. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Amen. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Having done all to, dis having done all to stand, stand therefore. Having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Amen. It says three different times in there to stand, friend. It don't say to sit down. We've got to stand. We've got to stand up. In this world that we're living in, people don't want to stand up. Nobody even wants to really be a Christian. You say you're a Christian. You put that little uh, Bible verse in your bio. you got the WWJD bracelet on. you got that stuff on the back of your car, friend. It means more. The, the one that died for you didn't die for you just to sit down. Amen. That, that, that fires me up, man. If, if, you, if we took hold on what Jesus Christ did for us at the cross of Calvary, you wouldn't be sitting down, friend. And I'm, I'm preaching to everybody here. Lord, burden I may not hit everybody here, but there's somebody in here that needs to hear this, bless God. And Lord, put this thing on my heart. And I couldn't shake it, man. I, I was saying, Lord, this thing's going to go over like a lead balloon. These people don't even know me. And I'm getting up here talking about this. Give me a psalm or give me a proverb or something. Give me something easy, Lord. I prayed on that for like four weeks. I was down there at the Jubilee, man. The Holy Ghost was so thick in that place you could about barely move. I've been down here to this altar so many times. I'm thinking, Lord, I know you're not calling me to preach. Not me, Lord. You remember what I used to be? 
that he said, Lord, you said, you just got to submit and get out of my way. And uh, that, that's how the Lord works right there. But as we can see in Ephesians 6, he's telling us to stand, friend. He ain't telling us to sit down. It's not time to sit down, man. There's too many people that are doing that. And, uh, you know, what that thing starts out is, it starts out as laziness, right? Yeah. We take a little C, all of a sudden the devil creeps in there, we don't even know it. All of a sudden we got an attitude problem, right? You're starting to, it's a critical spirit is what it is. Ah, oh, shoot, I could do better than this man. I could get up here and preach. Oh, why am I not getting called on for the special? I could sing better than her. That's how that thing starts, and then the devil creeps in there. And before you know it, you've taken a seat. And you don't even know, we're just taking a seat and, and life's passing us by. We get a critical spirit, you, come, you become complacent. I'll give you a good example of that thing. So we is down in Market Square, Brother John was with me, Brother Tony was with me. This is probably two weeks ago. We're out there doing some soul winning. Market Square is packed, man, you got, the, you got the enemies down there, you got the Jehovah's Witnesses, all these people. I'm sitting here, I'm dealing with this man, witnessing to him, go up to him, I give him Romans 6.23, we all know that one. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And I get to dealing with this guy, and in the background, there's a man just sitting there like this, just standing, smiling. Just, I'm not even talking to him. He's just in the background watching me. I get to dealing with this guy. He leaves. Um, guy in the background comes up to me, and he goes, man, I just love watching Christians witness to other people. And I was like, well, all right, you're next. Now, are you saved? And, you know, he tells me he's a Christian and so on and so forth, and he just loves watching people and listening to people witness. I said, you ever try it? He goes, well, if I, if I might add one thing, you ought not be talking about death. You shouldn't talk about death so much. And I said, shoot, you get out here. I said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, amen. You're over here criticizing me, and I'm trying to tell people about Jesus Christ. He's sitting here saying, well, you know, another thing I, I noticed is you ought to take your sunglasses off. Man, it's 85 degrees. The sun's beating down. You're talking to me about my sunglasses? Get out of here, man. And I said, you ever read that passage over there in Deuteronomy 25? Where that Bible says, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Amen. I said, have a good day, brother. <laughs> Amen. But that's how it is, man. Christians. Criticizing other Christians. You get out here on the street corners, you start preaching. Oh, you shouldn't be doing that. That drives people further away from Christ. Man, when you get out here and do something, you got that bat on your shoulder watching pitches go by. Yeah. You know, why don't you get the bat off your shoulder? Amen? Amen. But those things burn me up, man. I'll tell you another thing about what it looks like give you a practical example of somebody sitting down. I lead a, a Bible study, not with people in here, but with my coworkers. And, uh, you know, I was real fired up for it. I'm giving them all this strong meat, all these precepts, turn here, turn there. And I was super fired up. I gave them a challenge. I gave everybody a gospel track. I love passing out tracks. I'm old school. And I gave them a track, and I said, all right, guys, we're going to come back same time next week. Let's everyone tell our story about how you pass a track out to somebody come back next week ain't nobody passed the track out one dude spoke up and said you know I didn't pass the track out and I don't think I would because it's not effective that stuff doesn't really work and I just don't believe in really coming up to somebody and just giving them a track and walking off you see and uh, you know I didn't tell him I wasn't telling him hey give him a track and just walk off obviously you make it conversational and make it effective but that's the attitude these are saved born again Christians talking like that so you got to, I mean, we got to fight, friend. Everybody's sitting down. And let me, uh, there's a, here's a sign that you might have taken a seat and not known it. The Bible says um, in uh, 2 Timothy 3.12, if y'all want to turn there, you can. Yea, that all, all that will of godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If there ain't no persecution, man, and everything's easy, your whole life is going the way you want it to go, and, and you're not facing any sort of opposition, man, you're not living for Jesus Christ. That's a fact. I mean, you start getting under the spiritual, spiritual pressures, the spiritual persecution, that enemy starts coming against you. I remember what you used to be, or you did this and that. When you, you truly start to do some things for the Lord Jesus Christ, friend, you're going to start to suffer persecution. And that's just how it goes, man. I, I, Lucas talked about it the other day. I was facing a spiritual battle like two weeks ago. I had to get up here on my knees and say, Pastor, I need you to pray with me. And it was bad, man. I wanted to quit. Just like Lucas said, I wanted to quit. Satan was working me over, man. Remember, you used to do this. You used to be that. And I had to just say, look, you know, Satan, 
I know where my future is up there in glory, and I know where yours is. It's in a lake of fire, bless God. And that's what you got to do sometimes. And another sign that somebody may be taking, uh, taking a seat is if they get mad at Scripture, right? People get mad when you quote Scripture. Bless God, that burns me up. I quote a Bible verse. Well, it's not all about how much Scripture you know. I never said it was. But that Bible says in 1 Peter 4.11, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Amen? So, uh, you know, what did Jesus say when Satan tempted him? As it is written, as it is written, man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God doth man live. He quoted the scripture. He stuck to the book. Friend, we can't fight the enemy on our own. We've got to equip ourselves. Ephesians 6, 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That Ephesians 6 lists a whole bunch of stuff there. But it's all defense until you get to 17. It's a helmet. It's a breastplate. But you got that sword right there. That's your weapon in 617, Ephesians 617. This is the word of God. We can't, we're not strong enough to fight Satan on our own. We've got to get in the book. So we can see that Eutychus, the first step in his spiritual death was he took a seat. And um, let me tell you one more. In sports, anybody like sports in here? Anybody? Amen. Two hands, three hands, four hands. Hey, man. And uh, the only people sitting down in sports are the people that are on the bench. Amen? That'll preach. Come on. Everybody's looking down now. And, uh, you know, I got a story about that. I was a basketball player. I played a little bit in college. I thought I was a stuff. I'm 6'5", yada, yada. And uh, eighth grade year, right, West Valley Middle School, I was a little young punk, liked to run my mouth. And uh, I got in trouble halfway through the season. We was watching film in the locker room, and one of my buddies was on the opposite side of the locker room. I'm sitting on this side of the locker room. Coach is right here up here, you know, doing the film thing. And uh, he starts making all these little jokes at me and stuff, and we start snickering. Coach turns around and busts us, makes us run like 100 suicides in the gym. After that, man, I lost all my playing time just like that. I, sat, I, got, I got sat down on the bench, and you know what started to happen? My attitude started to change. I started to become bitter. I started criticizing my teammates. That's the same thing that we do, Christians. Yep. We, we take a seat. We sit down on that bench. We start looking around at our brothers and sisters in Christ. We get a critical spirit. I could do it better than them. How come they're getting this opportunity and I'm not? That's how those things happen, man. I got a critical spirit when I sat down on the bench. I started criticizing my teammates. It's the same way we start criticizing Christians. I started criticizing the coach. Coach said, all right, Sam, you're in. I said, Psh. I'm not going in. There's 60 seconds left. That's embarrassing. I don't even want to go in. That's the same way in the Christian life. You get sat down. You take a seat for so long that you start to like the view from the bench better than the game. Yeah, yeah. Amen? Amen? That's how that works, man. You start to get bitter with the coach. And this analogy would be God and with your teammates, which would be fellow Christians. That's how that thing works, man. Amen. And that fire starts to grow dim, bless God. Let's look. Uh, flip back over to Acts 20 for me real quick. So that's the first point. We see Eutychus sat down. But secondly, he was sitting down somewhere that he shouldn't have been, right? Why are you sitting down from the windowsill three stories up? We can all agree that that's not very safe, right? Like, you know, if you're sitting in a window and it's ground level, that's one thing. But we're talking three stories up. So he's somewhere that he shouldn't have been. Oftentimes, we start getting out of fellowship with Jesus Christ when we're somewhere that we shouldn't be be it a physical location, be it around people we shouldn't be, looking at things we shouldn't be. You know, you start going in a bar. I mean, bless God. Friend, I used to drink. I'll just be honest with you. I don't drink no more. That stuff's wicked. That's evil. It's out of the pit of hell. Christians shouldn't be drinking. I don't care. Oh, I can just have one beer. Man, I don't care. That's wickedness. That's wickedness. Christians shouldn't be in a bar. You know, one thing I was thinking is, is why are the bars always dark? Why do they turn the lights off in the bar? Well, I'm a Christian, and I, and I can have a drink, and... Well, Jesus drank wine. You want to get up at the judgment seat of Christ and you want to stand before the Lord God Almighty and say, well, Jesus, you drank wine. You want to talk about a lead balloon, man. I ain't doing that. But I'm just saying that Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil, friend. First Thessalonians 5.22. You know, I can just, friend, you can't have just one beer. Don't lie. Let's be honest here. We're all adults. And even if you did, that Bible says be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, walketh around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. 
So you get one sip of that beer, you take one little shot, one little drink, you're not sober anymore. You feel, you get that tingly feeling, you start getting all smiley. You're not sober. You may not be drunk, but you're not sober. So those are, that's an example of being somewhere you shouldn't be, friend. You play with fire, you get burned. We can agree that sitting in a third story window so is dangerous. We ought not do that, friend. Are you hanging around people that you shouldn't be hanging around? That Bible says over there in Amos 3, how can two walk together except they be agreed? Amen? That's the same way. If you're not walking with Jesus Christ, you're not in agreement with Him, and you're not in fellowship with Him. Bless God. There's so many people that I come around and come in contact with with work and different things, people that say they're Christian, but their fire's been put out. I don't want my fire put out. Don't come over here with the fire extinguisher when I'm on fire for the Lord trying to put me. No, don't do that. <laughs> oh, it's just not that serious. Well, why don't you loosen up? <laughs> why don't you just lay back, man? Why don't you? It's, it's not that serious. Yes, it is. It is to me. It didn't used to be, but bless God, it is now. <laughs> you got to lighten up. You got to loosen up. Why, why is it always that? Why don't they ever, ever thought of you need to tighten up? <laughs> is that ever an occurrence or I'm just totally in the wrong with right there? You know what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, I mean, sheesh, man, come on, tighten up, man. And, uh, you know, people want you to compromise. They want you to put your fire out, bless God. And if, I, if, if that Bible says, can two walk together except they be agreed, if, I don't, if we're not agreeing on something, I shouldn't be walking with you. I'm not saying that we can't have fellowship in certain areas, friend, but, you know, we ought to be able to, to be in agreement that we need to be serving Jesus Christ. And if, and if there's a rift there, then, then we got we to gotta get back right. And you know what it was with me? That Bible says over there in Psalm 18, 28, For thou wilt light my candle, the Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. Amen. That's what happened to me, friend. I was living in darkness, and the Lord lit my candle. Praise God. And, you know, that's what needs to happen to some of you guys. I don't know. I don't know some of you guys from the next man, but I have a feeling that some of you guys, I'm just, I'm just feeling some, that some people may not be on fire for the Lord as they should be. Yeah. Bless God. And we've got to be honest with ourselves, man, because we've all been there. It's just like hand up accountability. I used to be there. And this world, amen, I see that hand, brother. This world will do that to you, friend. You need to chill out. You need to chill out with this or that. Um, uh, well, it's, it's not all about the King James Bible. Yeah. Ever heard that one? Yeah. Yes, it is, friend. Amen. It is to me. Amen. It is to me. I don't go making fun of your Bible. Why do you want to make fun of my Bible? Oh, that's old English. Nobody speaks like that anymore. Yeah. Friend, that's the Word of God. Your Preach. thing's been revised how many times? Amen? amen. That's 1611, bless God. And they want to say, oh, it's not all about... Well, you're not King James only, are you? Or that one? Yes, I am. Is that a problem? <laughs> I am. This is the Word of God, friend. I'm not compromising. I still believe that I'm saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. I don't care what they do to Colossians 1.14. You, you know what that verse says? In whom we have redemption through His blood, bless God, even the forgiveness of our sins. The new Bibles take out through His blood. I'll leave it there. So the thing of it is, is that when you're somewhere you're not supposed to be, be it you're looking at something you shouldn't be looking at, you're with people that you shouldn't be, you're around people you shouldn't be, you're somewhere that you shouldn't be, you start to get out of fellowship with Jesus Christ. If people aren't helping you stay in fellowship with Jesus Christ, you ought not be around them. If we say that we have fellowship with Him, but walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, cleanseth us from all sin. Amen? Amen. Fellowship is so important, friends. We think that we get saved, and we get to just sit down and say, all right, I'll see you up there in glory one day. That's true, you will. But wouldn't you rather be in fellowship with the one who died for you? He longs to have that fellowship with us, friend. And you got to pick a side. Uh, you got to pick a side. The Bible says in James 4, friendship with the world is enmity with God. What side are you going to be on? Y'all remember that story in Exodus 32? Moses went up there and was, and was uh, speaking with the Lord. Every, you, you remember that story, Brother Barry? And everything uh, turned, uh, it got all turned upside down. His brother Aaron was leading things, and they made the idols of the golden calf. He comes back down, and everybody's run amok. Moses gets down there. I believe it's Exodus 32, 26, Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, who is on the Lord's side? You got to make a, you got to make a, you got to make a decision, friend. Whose side are you going to be on? Hey, man, you can't be on the side of the world in Jesus Christ. 
you got to pick a side, man, and it's today. You got to pick that side. Y'all know what Joshua 24, 15 says. If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, then choose you this day whom you will serve. You got to make a choice, friend. You can't be out there in the world. I used to be that guy, man. <laughs> Bless God. Oh, I'm saved. Nobody knew I was saved. <laughs> How embarrassing. You know? I wasn't living for the Lord, man. I had one foot in, one foot out. They call that a lukewarm Christian. That ain't going to get it, man. That ain't going to get it. At this church, man, none of us should be lukewarm. We got Pastor Charles Lawson up here faithfully preaching the Word of God. And we have the audacity to try to be lukewarm. Phew. Ain't no way, man. I'm very thankful for our pastor. I'm thankful for every one of you guys. I'm thankful for this church. Bless God. You cannot please Jesus Christ of being lukewarm. That's just a fact. And I'll tell you one thing. When I started serving the Lord, and I started getting out of my own way, and I started getting in that book, that King James Bible, hey man, I lost a lot of friends, almost all my friends, where they deal with me in little doses, but man, you're too much now. I stopped going places I shouldn't be. I stopped uh, hanging around people I shouldn't be. Nobody wanted nothing to do with me no more. I was just that weird Bible guy. I'll wear that one. <laughs> Ain't nothing better than being in fellowship with the one who died for you. If everybody just take hold of that, I mean, whew, that right there will preach in and of itself, man. And, uh, you know, uh, I, uh, what's it, First Peter 4, 4, wherein they think it's strange that you run not with them. They think I'm strange. I'm not running with that crowd if you're not on the same side as Jesus Christ. Those are contrary, friend. You know what Paul said in uh, second, I think it's 2 Timothy 4, 16? He said, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. Verse 17, notwithstanding, hey man, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. Friend, if you got the Lord, you don't need nobody else. <laughs> you, you don't need nobody else, man. Eternity is a long time. You're going to get up there at the judgment seat of Christ and get stripped of everything? How dare you make the Lord take those rewards away from you? He don't want to do that. He's a rewarder of those who earnestly and diligently seek Him. Amen. The Lord is waiting. Not only did He save your soul, He's waiting to give you rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. How dare you live your life and, and, and make Him take those rewards from you? He don't want to do that. Now, I know we're not perfect, right? We're going to slip up, but I, I think that's one of the devil's favorite saying. Well, we're not all perfect. Nobody said we were, friend. Boy, isn't that just like a cop-out to say we don't have to try? Yeah. I'm never going to be perfect. Hey, man. Amen. Whew, burns me up, man. <laughs> Jesus Christ is worth it, friend. There's nothing this world can offer you that's better than being in fellowship with Jesus Christ. Amen. That's just a fact. The Bible says in, in Ephesians 5, 18, Be ye not therefore partakers with them. He brought us out of this world and chose us. That's how precious we are to him. The Bible says, Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. 2 Corinthians six seventeen. And, and here's another one, right? I deal with people all the time when I'm witnessing to people. And um, they'll say, well, you know, I don't want to get saved because I can't live the Christian life. You know, that's a good one. And that Christian life looks boring. It's not fun. I guess they ain't never read uh, Pro, uh, Psalms 8411, right? Where it says, The Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will He withhold from them that walk uprightly. Bless God. Amen. Amen. Hey, friend, the things that are truly good that the Lord has prepared for you, He's not going to uphold those if you're in fellowship with Jesus Christ. He's going to give you those things gladly. But the things this world has offered us takes us further and further away from Him. So we can see, Eutychus' first step was he sat down. Secondly, he was sitting up in that windowsill three stories up somewhere that he shouldn't be. And we can see how this thing starts to progress. We can see that sometimes even in our own life. Let's look at another one real quick. Somebody who wasn't where they're supposed to be. 1 Kings 19. Familiar passage. We're talking about Elijah. Lord, showed me something different. I'm in the hotel. I'm in a hotel down there. I just got back from Jacksonville. Some of y'all came in a little later and didn't hear that part. But me and Brother John were down there. And, man, I'm surprised we didn't get kicked out of that hotel. You talk about, we're witnessing to everybody there, man. There's a Hindu dude at the desk. John's down there dealing with him for about 10 minutes. He calls me. He says, yo, bro, come down here. I said, all right, let's go. I come down there. I said, I walk over to him, bust the conversation up. I said, what's the deal? I said, are you saved? And, I mean, he's a Hindu, so he had about 1,000 gods. So that we kind of spun our wheels in the mud on that one there. But we was witnessing to everybody there in the elevator. Man, it was, 
I'm surprised we didn't get kicked out of that thing. But um, I'm sitting in my room about 12, 12 at night after I'm listening to preaching all day. God takes me over there to 1 Kings 19. I was like, okay, Lord, I've read this a thousand times, you know, Elijah and all this and that. But he showed me something different in this time. This is a good example. You think of Elijah and all the great things that he's done. Friend, I got a blessing out of this. He was somewhere that he shouldn't be. Uh, 1 Kings 19. Let's pick it up in 7 real quick. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went. And the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights under Horeb, the mount of God. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? Drop down here uh, to eleven. And the Lord said to him, and he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. Amen. And then let's drop down here to 12. And after the earthquake of fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a still small voice. And it was so, when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in the mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there was a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? That's the second time that God said that to him. He wasn't supposed to be in the cave. Y'all know the story. Jezebel seeks his life. He goes and tucks tail and runs, hides in the cave. This is the man that had just called fire down from heaven. He had nothing to be afraid of. That was God's man. But then we can see him hiding in a cave. The Lord said, go stand upon top of the mountain. You're on top of a mountain. You're not ashamed. You're not afraid. Everybody can see you. But he was hiding in that cave. And how many times are we hiding in a cave in our life? Just like Elijah. God's done a good work in our life. And then all of a sudden, you know, the world kicks us around a little bit. We want to go hide in a cave. It could be the same thing, friend. If Elijah can be somewhere that he shouldn't be, how much more can that happen to us? Amen. Amen. That's why it's so important that we stay in fellowship with the Lord. Thirdly, in Acts 20, we can see that um, first he sat down in a window. He took a seat. He took a load off, took a break. Secondly, he was sitting somewhere that he shouldn't be. Thirdly, it says, while Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with, he sunk down with sleep. And that's the same thing. The third point is, is in a deep sleep. Are you falling into a deep sleep today? That's how that progression works. I'm in Acts 20, verse 9. That's how the progression works, friend. First, you take a seat. Starts out small. No big deal. Secondly, the world influences you. And then thirdly, before you know it, you've fallen asleep. You've fallen into a deep sleep. When you've fallen into a deep sleep, you're just completely going through the motions. And friend, here's where that all comes from. The root of falling asleep comes from taking for granted what Jesus Christ did for you at Calvary. Amen. How many times have we heard that story? The cross of Calvary, the cross of Calvary, the gospel, the gospel. We know that story. We know about the cross. We believe it. That's what we believed in when we first got saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. But how many times do we apply that on a daily basis to our life? If you really knew what Jesus Christ went through to buy your salvation at the cross of Calvary each and every day, you wouldn't be living like a lukewarm Christian. There's no way. Friend, when I got saved, I was 10 years old at Rocky Hill Baptist Church, bless God. And I thank God that that Holy Ghost kept on knocking. He kept on knocking. I didn't get saved the very first time. I was sitting there white knuckle in the pew. You know, the Holy Ghost was convicting me. Sam, you're a sinner. You're going to go to hell. You need to get saved. No, nah, I'll do it next Sunday. Maybe next, I don't want to walk the aisle. I don't, want to, I don't want to be embarrassed in front of my friends. Maybe next Sunday. But bless God that the Holy Ghost kept on knocking. And he kept on knocking. He didn't give up on me. Bless God that preacher kept on preaching the gospel. Bless God that choir director sang one more stanza. And praise God the good happy day I walked that aisle and said, I'm getting saved. The Lord convicted me and said, if you go to sleep tonight, you're going you're gonna to burn in the devil's hell. Amen. I still believe hell's hot, friend. These new churches teach that hell is just separation from God. That isn't biblical. That's out of the pit of hell. Who could stand to benefit from just saying that hell is separation from God? Anybody know? I think Satan could, right? That don't sound too bad. An unbeliever, you're going to go up to him and say, hey, you've got to get saved or you're going to be separated from God. How's that going to work? That don't mean anything to them. They've been separated from God their whole entire life. That's just like another day for them. Hell is fire, friend. <laughs> Whosoever's name is not found written in the book of life shall be cast into the lake of fire. Right. Revelation 20, verse 15. I still believe in Mark 9, 44, too. They take that out of the new Bibles. Where the fire is not quenched and the worm dieth not. Right. Friend, it's, 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 
We take for granted the fact that before we got saved, we were lost and we were going to hell. I don't care how young you were. The Bible says that he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Has it been so long since you got saved that you forgot that you were once lost? Do we take that for granted? That's a big deal, friend. If Jesus Christ never did another thing for me but save my soul from hell, that's more than enough. Amen. Amen. And we take that for granted because we hear the cross, the cross, the cross, Calvary, the gospel so much that we don't let it sink down in our hearts and affect the way that we're living. But we ought not be that way. Amen. If you fall asleep, this is where you don't have a burden for souls anymore. Proverbs 24. Let's go to Proverbs 24. This verse changed my life. You know, you just start seeing people as people and you don't see them as souls. Friend, you're either going to go to heaven or you're going to go to hell. And uh, I know that's tough and I know it's early and your caffeine ain't kicked in yet. And you're thinking, what in the cat hair is this kid doing up here? And so on and so forth. I get that. That's cool. But if I didn't preach this message, I might have got struck by lightning. The Lord laid this thing heavy on me and I was like, there can't, this can't be what you're telling me to get up here and talk about for the very first time. And he said, yeah, it is. What are you going to do about it? And I said, I'm going to the altar, Lord. Let's work it out. <laughs> and he wouldn't let me get away from it. I'm down there hanging out with Tony. Y'all know how intense he is, telling me all his war, story, war stories and so on and so forth. Man, he said, you just got to, what the Lord's laid on your heart, you can't run from it. And I said, all right, here we go. And uh, all right, we're in Proverbs 24. When you've fallen into deep sleep, friend, you start to, you don't have a burden for souls anymore. Let's pick it up here real quick in um, verse number 10. If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death and those that are ready to be slain. If thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not. Doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? And he that keepeth thy soul, doth not he know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? We all have heard Mark 16, 15, Go out and preach the gospel to every creature. But you just read this passage, right? That's talking about telling people about Christ. You're not going to be able to get up there and say, Lord, I didn't know that. It says those that are drawn unto death, ready to be slain. Those that are drawn unto death are those who are unsaved. So we know that we have that obligation, friends. So we should, be, we should have a burden for lost souls. And I'm going to hit on this next point real quick. Let's go to Amos 8. Amos chapter 8. And sadly, friend, a lot of the problem with this sleepwalking Christianity and this lukewarm Christianity comes from the churches. It's sad, man. It's sad. You know, these churches have replaced the man of God. You know, he's not wearing a suit and tie anymore. And let me tell you something. A suit and tie don't make you spiritual, but it's a testimony. Your neighbor sees you backing out of the driveway at 8 a.m. and you got a suit on. They don't think you're going to the boat ramp. They know you're going to church. They see you out there at the chop house after church and you got your suit and tie at 12 p.m., they know where you came from, friend. That's a testimony. They replaced the man of God in the pulpit. He's got his ripped skinny jeans on and his sneakers, and he's got his iPad, and you know he, he got away from the King James Bible, and it's all about they've replaced the, the, the choir, and they've got the screens, they've got the light show, they've got the fog, they've got the rock and roll band, and they've taken out the blood of Jesus Christ. They've stopped preaching on hell. They've stopped preaching on sin. And you see these Christians in this world that we're living in now, and you couldn't even tell they're Christians. Amos 8 and verse number 11, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst of, for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. That's the day and age that we're living in. The Bible says in Psalms 107, verse number 2, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Friend, we're redeemed. We ought to be jumping up and down right now, man. The Lord has redeemed us from the hand of the enemy. That's how much he loves us. But sadly, we've got these churches that are just going through the motions. And it starts with the preachers, man. I'm so thankful for our church and our pastor. These preachers nowadays... They don't got enough fire in them to spark an easy bake oven, man. They couldn't, pre they couldn't preach their way out of a wet paper sack, man. I'm serious. I've been to these churches. I swear, man, I've been to these churches. They, they go up there and they put a bunch of uh, quotes from A.W. Tozier and C.S. Lewis, and it's not about the Word of God. I want to hear the Word of God. I need to hear the Word of God when I come to church. That's why I come here. 
And that's why I'm thankful for our church. But the churches we've got in America now, they're limp-wristed, and they're not preaching the Word of God. And that's just a fact. One more. Let's go over to 2 Timothy 4.8, and I'm coming to a close. Anybody like cookies in here? Y'all like cookies? I love cookies, man. You see where I'm going with that in a second. Kid got his hand in the cookie jar. Y'all ever heard that story? 2 Timothy 4 and verse number 8. So uh, the story goes, there's two brothers, right? One younger, one older. The mama bakes some cookies, puts them in the cookie jar, fresh out of the oven, says, I'm going to go down to the store real quick. I'm going to get a thing of milk. Don't touch those cookies. I'll be right back. The younger brother goes in there, and he has his hand in the cookie jar right when mama walks back in. And mama scolds him and so on and so forth. But the point is, is that that kid got his hand in the cookie jar at the appearing of his mother. Nobody's questioning the fact that he loves his mother or not. But did he love her appearing at that very moment? Would you love Jesus Christ appearing at this very moment? Amen. We say that we would, you know, absent from the body, present from the Lord. But are you right with him? Have you done your best for Jesus? Second Timothy 4, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness with the Lord the righteous judge shall give to me at that day. Amen. Not to me only, but unto all that also love his appearing. Do you love his appearing, or would you get, your, would you get caught with your hand in that cookie jar if he came back right now? You got some things in your life that you, you ought to get right with him? I know that's tough to preach, easy to, or uh, hard to live, easy to preach. Like Tony says, that, that's very true. Um, but are, are we truly in fellowship with him? If he were to come back right now, would we really love that other than the fact that, okay, we'd be in glory? And the fourth and final point that we can see in our text here, in Acts chapter 20, the original text, where it says, The Eutychus being fallen into deep sleep, as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep, fell down from the third loft, and was taken up dead. That's the result, friend, of all these different things that we've talked about. Before you know it, you're spiritually dead, and you're just going through life. Life's beating you down, and you haven't had a chance to really get back right with the Lord. If that's you today, if any of these points are you today, if you've taken a seat, today's the day to get back right with the Lord. He's coming soon, friend. And if we are we're, uh, dispensational pre-trib believers and we believe the rapture could happen at any moment, wouldn't you want to be right with the Lord right now? Wouldn't you want to be telling everybody you know about Jesus Christ? Um, a spiritually dead person may show up at church, but they're not paying attention. The preaching isn't getting through to them. You're telling them, hey, let's turn here, let's turn there. Their, their, their Bible's uh, not even moving. Um, and, and Jesus Christ died for us, and he doesn't want us just to give him one hour a week on Sunday, friends. He's worth way more than that. Um, and uh, he loves you so much, he, wants to, he desires to have fellowship with you. Um, and I'm going to tell you one more story, and then we'll pray us out of here. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that say, okay, well, you know, soul winning isn't that important. It's not that important to spread the gospel. That's what we've got missionaries for. And praise God for missionaries, right? Like, we need missionaries. But, friend, each and every one of you that's in this house today, if you can hear my voice, God has called you to be able to tell Jesus Christ, tell the story of Jesus Christ and the gospel to other people. Me and a couple guys, John Jones, Brother Tony, we started uh, doing some soul winning. About one month ago, and five people have gotten saved. And that's not a testimony to me. I used to be a low-down, rotten, dirty dog, just as bad as anybody. Um, but by the grace of God, you know, I've came back to the Lord like that prodigal son. I came back home, and God started to use me, and I'm very thankful for that. And I'll tell you a story. We, uh, I believe it was Friday night. We're in Jacksonville, Florida. Just got done here and preaching. We go to dinner about 10.45 p.m., in Jacksonville, uh, we get out of the restaurant super late, like 1130. I'm cutting through the parking lot. John's riding shotgun. He can testify to this. I see a man in the parking lot sideways from me. We're in a place that's probably like Turkey Creek. I pull up to him in my car and I said, hey, man, has anybody ever told you Jesus Christ loves you so or God loves you so much? He sent Jesus Christ to die for you. And he just shook his head and said, and I said, would you like to hear that? And he said, and dude, I sprung out of that car, left the car running. I, I walked over there like I was Conor McGregor or something. And, uh, you know, I said, uh, you know, uh, you probably never see me a day again in your life. You need to get saved. God's telling me you need to get saved. Would you like to get saved? He took the Bible out, showed him some verses, and he said, I think I'd like to get saved. Amen. This man had face tattoos, neck tattoos. Whew. He took my hand right there. He had tears in his eyes. He knew that he was a sinner, that he was going to hell. 
He believed in the death, burial, resurrection, friend. He got saved. But that's just a testimony that if you get out of your own way and you're not scared and you start serving Jesus Christ, that people will start getting saved. I love each and every one of you guys. Thankful for this church, this church family. Thankful for y'all listening to me. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll pray us out of here. Father God, thank you for your word today, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, hope I didn't put my foot in my mouth too much, Lord. Hope that people would take this word and uh, let it uh, sink into their hearts and that we'd be different than we came in, Lord, and that we'd be not just hearers of the word, but doers as well. Father God, we love you. Thank you most of all for Jesus Christ and his precious blood that saved our souls. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Thank you all.